So today we're going to continue with partial fractions. The procedure for unsimplifying fractions, breaking them up into elements that are simple enough that you can integrate. And we've already dealt with a number of situations in the last lecture, but there are two situations with which we did not deal, and those will occupy our attention today. Number one, you don't yet know what to do when a factor appears in the denominator twice. Here's what I mean. Here's an example. So there are actually two days, two days, there are two ways of dealing with this. And I will show you both, and then you can use whichever one you prefer. And of course, what, one of the things we discovered yesterday is that this partial fractions procedure has very little to do with the integration that's, that we're trying to accomplish. It's really a standalone algebraic task of expressing this fraction in a different way. So let's just do this separately. Rather than keep wrapping it in, in the integration sign and be confused about what we're actually doing, let's make it explicit that all we're trying to do right now is work with this fraction. Because once you simplify it, or maybe unsimplify it, in the way that helps you integrate, the rest is actually very easy and becomes a, an example of something that we've done previously and that by now you're all very good at. So I won't even focus on that much. So these few lectures are really not as much about integration as there are about algebra. So here is one of two ways to approach this. All right. So you do a very similar thing here. You break up this complicated fraction into a sum of simple fractions with the individual factors in the denominator, but with a twist. So the first one will be something over x. The second one will be something over x minus 1. And finally, the third one will need to be the same factor squared. Because if you don't have a factor like this, you're just not going to get this denominator. So if you want to get this denominator, you have to throw it in as an independent ingredient that we didn't have before. And so if you know to do that, the rest is the same. And right now there's a slight deviation from the recipe that I gave last time, and I'll clarify it when we talk about the second way of doing the exact same thing. So now we're facing with the cumbersome step, step of combining these fractions into a single fraction just to see what's going on in the numerator and then match it up with 2x plus 3. So I just have to assume that you're good at this step and so without focusing on too much detail I'll just write out what, what's in the numerator. Well first let's get the denominator right. This guy, a, will get multiplied by x minus 1 squared because that's what's, missing in the that's what's missing in the denominator here compared to this denominator. So a needs to be multiplied by x minus 1 squared, and I will actually multiply it out because I have to combine like terms. That's a times x minus 1 squared. This guy is lacking x times x minus 1. So that's what b will get multiplied by. And once again, I'll just multiply it out. And then c, the only thing that this fraction is lacking is a multiple of x. So it'll just be plus cx. Let's continue. Where should I continue? I guess I'll continue right here. Equals. Now let's combine like terms ax squared plus bx squared, so a plus bx squared. Now combining the x terms, minus 2a minus b plus c. Minus 2a minus b plus c. And finally the free term, a. So now, we have to match this up with this. So a plus b has to be 0, 
because there is no x squared here. So a plus b must be 0. Minus 2a minus b plus c needs to be 2 because that's the linear term. And a needs to be 3. So you can look at it as three equations with three unknowns, but I don't think you should look at it that way because you can just pick out the solutions, the, not the solutions, you can pick out the values of the coefficients. For instance, a equals 3, that's clear. That's what this says right here, a is 3. Then from here, b must be minus 3, you guys are with me on that? And then finally, c, well, we have to plug in a and b here. So let's see. Minus 6 plus 3. And that's minus 3. So C must equal 5. So let me write this in here. A is 3. And now we're done with partial fractions. We have rep represented this in intractable, complicated fraction as a sum of three very simple fractions, fractions, each of which you can integrate rather easily. This produces 3 log x. This produces minus 3 log natural of x minus 1. And finally, this produces 1 over x minus 1 with a minus sign because it's because it's 1 over something squared that comes from 1 over something don't be thrown by this it's one of those things where it's maybe so simple you're used to looking for arctans and logs that when you get something simpler a simple power you might get confused momentarily so don't get confused by this so this will actually be minus 5 divided by x minus 1. So that's the easy part. The integration is the, real, is the easy part. This is the hard work. Now I will show you how to do this task in a different way, but more consistent with what we said yesterday. All right, here's another way to do the algebra more consistent with the recipe that we laid out yesterday. And that is to only have two fractions, one with x in the denominator and the other one with this square in the denominator. And now remember what we said, that whatever the degrees in the denominator, the polynomial in the numerator should be of degree one less than what's in the denominator. So here, we have no choice but to just have a. But this is a quadratic polynomial. So we can afford to have a linear polynomial on top. So we'll write it as bx plus c. The advantage of this approach is that it's, I guess, fits yesterday's recipe a little bit more neatly. And now we do the combining. And now there's a little bit less work on top. So A gets the same multiple, and Bx plus C just needs to be multiplied by X. So do you see the advantage here, an additional advantage, is that there are fewer terms to deal with, so maybe it's a little bit less work. In the end, it won't be, so it's a matter of personal preference. So let's once again combine the like terms. So once again, we need to match up this numerator with 2x plus 3. So once again, a plus b is 0. Okay, c minus 2a is 2. So you guys see, a little bit different. 2, and a is 3. I like blue more than green, so I'm going to stick to using blue for now. All right, so once again, A equals 3. B equals minus 3. And C equals 
<coughs> okay, so C minus 6 equals 2. C minus 6 equals 2, so C is 8. Okay, so here's what we have. 3 minus 3 and 8. So would you guys agree with me that this step was a little bit easier yes. doing this algebra? However, are we ahead or are we behind the original method? So you'll see that we're a little bit behind. So we're here. This is no problem. Right? But what do we do with this? This is still not quite ready to be integrated. You guys agree with me? So we have to do what we did at the end of the last example that we did, where we have to break this up in a, in a nice way. So for instance, what we want to have in the numerator is the derivative of the denominator. Okay, how about this? So we, we all agree that more work is required. Yes. So here is one of the things you could do. You could represent 8 as 3 plus 5. And I'll show you why this is useful. So I, instead of 8, I will have 3 plus 5. And the advantage of that is that here I can factor out 3 or even minus 3 and I will have x minus 1, which will cancel one of these x minus 1s. That was the point. The number that I wanted to leave here was such that if I factored it out, I would have x minus 1 in parentheses. And so I see that this expression becomes and not surprisingly, we ended up with exactly what we had just a moment ago when we did the other part of the algebra in that slightly different way. And now, once again, each term is easily integrated just as before. So I was actually going to do a poll on which, on which way do you prefer. But I think that now that I've explained it once, I realized that the first one was superior, because you don't have to, to deal with this step, right? Yeah. When you think you're done, and then you have to do additional work, and then you end up with the exact same thing as before, except you had to use a little bit of ingenuity to get there. I think it's not worth it. So let's just chalk this up as experience, and just stick with the original way of doing things. Okay? Okay, good. So if that's what you do when the factor appears twice or even more times. If this was cubed, then going back to the original way of doing this, you would have one term over x minus 1 plus another constant over x minus 1 squared plus another constant over x minus 1 cubed. And that way you could handle anything that you encounter in the denominator. 